Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Gonna be working on the LS1 motor again, uh, the 1LE. This is gonna be part five of the engine build series for the car. Um, finally, finally got uh, some stuff in stock that I was waiting for to get this thing built. The main thing that I was waiting for is this camshaft installer tool specifically for the LS motors. And another thing that I needed as well was one of these piston ring installer for, uh, or I should say the piston and ring installer to put the pistons back in the block. Uh, the one that I currently had was for a four plus inch bore and I needed one a little bit smaller. So I just got one sized for this specific motor at 3.898 inches or 99 millimeters. So without further ado, I'm gonna start getting into uh, putting this thing back together, starting with the camshaft bearings. All right, for the cam bearing install, got my Durban cam bearings. That is the brand that I chose to go with for this LS build. And then of course, have the LS sized camshaft bearing installer tool and a good hammer. And with these bearings, they're just like the factory bearings. They are actually marked one, two, three, two, one. And as you can see, this is just a 10-1, but that last number is what you're looking for. And the installation of these would be one, two, three, four, five, or actually do one, two, three, four, five. Um, as long as these are your outer bearings, these are your middle bearings, and your center bearing on an LS motor, uh, specific for LS motors on this, guys. And just to show you guys on the old bearings, they came out the same way. This is actually the front of the block. This is the back of the block. And starting with the front, you've got a one. You've got a, you've got a two. You got a three. You've got a two. And you have a one right there. So three different sizes of bearings for these motors. And again, you have one, two, three, two, one. And I will say that the GM bearings for these were very, very pricey. Again, I really would have liked to use GM cam main and rod bearings for this motor, but they were ridiculously expensive. So I chose to go with some aftermarket ones. These Durabond bearings are between 20 and $25 a set and the GM bearings were literally $40 a piece. So GM bearings would have been $200 versus $20. Yeah, you do the math on that one too. And when it came to the rods and mains, it was going to be, let's just say it was gonna be at least $700 for all the bearings from GM. And I got all these bearings for under $200. And what I went with is the Model E Cleavites, for the mains and same for the rod bearings. These are the P series for standard LS motors. Well, I should say standard rod, standard crank because I'm going to be reusing the rotating assembly in that. And I am gonna say this early in the video. I know in the last video I said I was gonna reuse my piston rings and I literally lost fucking sleep over it. So, as you can see behind me, I did get new piston rings for the piston. So again, I'm gonna be reusing the whole rotating assembly, but with the bump hone I did, I am going to reuse uh, new rings. These obviously are Hastings, and they're just factory replacement rings as far as they're for a 99 millimeter bore, and they match the 1.5 millimeter upper two rings and the three millimeter oil rings. So thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And I, yeah, I'm not gonna fuck around. I'm just gonna put new rings in it just to be on the safe side. So while I have reused rings in the past four and a lot of guys do, I just did, I didn't wanna lose any more sleep over it. So new rings as well. I, I really don't know what would be the best brand of rings to go with. If you're not using uh, GM rings, and once again, the GM rings were $40 a piston. So, you know, math on that, 320 bucks for 
a set of eight rings and those were 130 bucks i believe so again would have liked to use the gm stuff but i just i can't afford it uh this is just adding up way too much so so for those of you guys that have never installed cam bearings super easy to do uh, you can definitely do it yourself you must have a tool though that's the most important thing so you drive these in the block perfectly square and perpendicular to the block um, again this one is specifically got the head cut for ls only bearings so it's not an adjustable one like a lot of them this one just is for ls blocks a um, couple things on this if you've never done it before the main thing is to make sure your surfaces are perfectly i mean perfectly clean and they recommend installing these dry so uh, don't lube them up just install them dry that's just what the recommendation normally is on the cam bearings and i say cam bearings only on that and i've just got this set up to kind of show you guys how it's going to go i cannot hold the camera and do this at the same time it's definitely a two-handed job but they have uh, basically a tapered bore here that will align the shaft of the installer uh, with the tool end here and essentially what you want to do is this is on the number four position You're going to basically put the bearing over this and you're going to want to slide it in to the bearing surface or the the, the bearing bore on the block and while holding that It's very centered making sure keeping this centered and then you're going to want to hit the end of this with a hammer with a decent amount of force to drive the bearing. And if you're wondering where to put the bearing, usually there's some pretty good marks left on the block where the old bearing goes. So, but pretty much you just want to have it centered inside that bore. And now the number one most important thing on this whole job is going to be the, uh, the, the clocking, you know, or the orientation of the bearing in the block. Let me pull this bearing tool out, grab one of these old bearings here and show you guys, there are two oil ports on these bearings. That's very critical where the orientation of that goes. Um, these want to be oriented down, which is actually up because the block is upside down and the one needs to be directly centered on your oil port on the block. This LS block, and I'm not sure about all of them, how they are, but this one particularly does not have anything on the other side. It just has one oil port, the same all the way down. So you want to orient this so one hole is oriented with the oil port and the other side is basically at a downward angle at what would normally be about eight o'clock or so again this is upside down so just so we're on the same page here as it sits now with the block upside down 180 degrees the one oil port is essentially at about 10 o'clock and the other one is essentially at about two o'clock. So, and if you have to verify this with a mirror or however, when you get this done or before you start driving it, just make sure that that oil port lines up. That's very super critical. And then the other thing would be when you do these, you don't want to start at the front and go to the back uh, if it's on an engine stand because you cannot get the tool past the bearings, obviously. So you always want to start at the back and work your way to the front. Um, if this block was just stationary, not on a stand, it was just upside down, then it wouldn't really matter. You can start on this side or start on this side. Just make sure your orientation on the bearings is one, two, three, two, one. But again, start from the back, work your way to the front when installing them. So now, since I don't have four hands, I'm going to get these bearings installed. I'm going to hit those surfaces one more time on all five of the uh, bores and make sure they're super clean before I drive these bearings in. All right, 
Fast forward about 10 minutes or so, and I've got all the bearings installed. And show you guys the orientation of the oil hole and these marks. I actually pretty much lined up almost exactly the holes where they were with the old bearings that I took out. And loving this new tool. It is, uh, it's been really nice for installing these bearings. The first time I've used this tool and it's been great. Uh, this tool is one I got from Summit. This is the Summit brand Ellis installer. And I got to uh, also mention on the front bearing, best thing to do is just unscrew this piece. And I just use this and just tap it in with a hammer gently, making sure to stay centered. Just because if you use the whole bar, having it hang out in the front here, it's gonna be really difficult to try and hold it centered. So I think that's probably why this is uh, made to be removable. But that is the easiest way that I have found to do the bearings on this block or any other block. I've used the expanding die tools before where this is expandable and it you kind of expand it to fit and I really hate using them. So for a hundred bucks, I definitely will be using it on this motor and I'll be using it on that motor. So even just using a tool twice, uh, a lot of times what I like to do is if I'm gonna use a tool uh, two or three or four times and it's not that expensive, I like to try and have a tool if it's a special tool like that just because it's, it's really nice to have around if you can afford it. If not, um, I know your machine shops, if they're doing your block work, they charge a very minimal amount to do the cam bearings. So for those of you guys that don't have a tool or don't want the tool, just have the machine shop guy install the bearings for you um, if you don't want the hassle of doing it. Okay, moving on to the crank bearings. And on an LS motor, middle bearing is the thrust bearing. So always remember that, guys. And especially when you're looping up that bearing, remember to lubricate the uh, outer surfaces where it is going to ride on the crank. So again, orientation is always one, two, three, four, five, with that being the front. I know I've got it backwards for you guys. So for you, OCD fucks out there, here we go. We're gonna do it this way, flip it around, and front of the motor, we got one, two, three, four, and five. So from this point forward, just so you guys are not confused, because I can see myself getting screwed up by this too, I'm going to build on this side of the block so we have a clear understanding. This is one, this is five, moving left to right. All right, we've got the bearings situated here. I do not have them inserted. I've just got them temporarily placed to show you guys what we've got going on here. And again, you want all of these surfaces, especially where your bearings are gonna ride, you want them very clean and very dry. So I like to use brake cleaner for all this stuff. Uh, cleans it up really nice and clean. Um, you just want to make sure there is Nothing in here, you wanna make sure it's clean and dry um, as much as possible because you don't want any tolerance variation when you put these in. And it's not very hard on these, um, the outer bearings on the crank are the same size. Uh, they're not really numbered, it's just all of these four are the same. Your thrust bearing is of course different and the bearings themselves are marked upper meaning upper block and then i'm going to show you guys this thrust bearing here if i can find it there we go it is marked lower as in lower block and just to show you guys you cannot really screw this up just because you have your indexing tab and as you can see in the block this indexes correctly this would not so it's i Always good to double check, but on an LS motor on the crank, um, it's kind of hard to screw up just because of the way that the bearings index. 
as long as you make sure that thrust bearing is right in the middle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double check. I'm gonna make sure my surfaces are as clean as possible. And then I am going to press those in and all you have to do is just give a good push down and they usually seat just fine. And then I'm gonna come back and put my assembly lube on all the bearing surfaces and I'm gonna seat my crank in here. Fast forward, we've got the five bearing journals lubricated with some assembly lube and got the crank set in place. Now is time to check the clearances. And I highly recommend you guys do this, especially if you're changing from one brand of bearing to another or any rebuild that you're doing, just to be on the safe side to make sure your clearances are good for your oil. And if you've never done this before, <clears throat> Uh, the simplest way I do it is just using a plastic gauge. Uh, you can find these online or most of your parts stores will have these. This is for one to three thousandths and it comes in a strip like this. Inside the strip is a little tiny piece of plastic filament, um, color coded depending on which set of these you get. And the service specs for the LS1 are, if I remember right, 15 ten thousandths to 23 10 thousand somewhere in there what I'm shooting for is right around two thousands so if I can get this thing somewhere between 15 10 thousands um, or you know that's one and a half thousands or roughly two thousands of an inch that'll be perfect and how this works is you're going to put your lower bearing on you're gonna put your cap on and you're gonna torque the whole thing to spec and what I'm going to do is going to put a piece on every single bearing surface and put the bearings on, put the caps on, torque it down. And when I pull this apart, this is going to be smashed flat to somewhere in here. And what I want is two thousandths. So the second from the left here in that green, that's about how wide that filament should be smashed. So when I pull this apart, Hopefully I have a little green strip about that wide. Okay, and I'm also going to do uh, torque values on the caps for you guys. I'm not gonna do the whole block sequence. You can find that online pretty easy, but on the caps is pretty important. Uh, the caps is 15 foot pounds for the inners, 15 foot pounds for the outers, and you have to torque them to a certain degrees. And the inners is 80 degrees and the outers is 53 degrees. So you're gonna wanna torque 15 plus 80 and 15 plus 53 will get your correct torque value for the caps. I'm gonna go ahead and hit that now. Now, because this is also my day job, this is actually the torque wrench that I have to do this. Um, most of you guys are not gonna have the uh, access to one of these, but this is probably one of the better ones to use. And yep, yeah, looks like I need to replace my battery too. So this one is a snap-on tech wrench. This is one of the newer models. This goes up to 150 foot-pounds. It's a 3 8 drive and you can set anything from inch pounds to newton meters on this to whatever degrees you want to on top of that. So you probably don't have access to one of these but this is a very awesome tool. If you can find one of these or a buddy will let you borrow one, this is probably the best tool you can use to assemble one of these motors because it's, it's pretty precise. Okay, so what I have done is I've just done one main to show you guys the principle and the concept of this so you can do it yourself. I didn't do the whole motor just because I don't want to set up all five, torque all five down and show you on camera. It's going to be a long drawn out process. It's boring and I'm sure you guys don't want to see it. So I'm just going to show you the one. And as you can see here, there's a little bit left of the filament that didn't get crushed that's outside the bearing and then what was crushed by the bearing itself. And if you take your strip here and match up the numbers, I mean, I realize it is upside down, but you guys can kind of see. So we have 1,000 and that's too tight of a clearance, but it is also not smashed down that much. You have 15 thousandths, which is kind of optimal. And as you can see, it's not quite as wide. I'm gonna see if I can get a little bit closer on this. And as you can see, it is definitely closer to the 2,000th mark, but it's definitely not as narrow as the 3,000th. So that's good. We are somewhere between the 2,000th and the 15 
10 thousandths um, that it really should be. Like I said, I was shooting for two thousandths, so I really think we're good there. Somewhere between two thousandths and 15, 10 thousandths. So this should make good oil pressure. It shouldn't have a problem running the factory oil in it. And now comes the process of getting this off. It is kind of a plastic material. You don't want to scrape it off because you don't want to damage your mirrored surface. Uh, if you rub it with brake cleaner enough, it will come off. Just remember to take it off your bearings as well because part of it will stick to your bearings. So clean that up, put some more lube on it, reassemble your caps, and you're done with the crank. Now you have to do the rest of the motor. So for me, that's what I have to do. So I'm going to clean that up. I'm going to do the whole motor as far as, well, I shouldn't say the whole motor. I'm going to do all five mains. And then uh, come back after I have done that and torqued everything down and the crank is set in its final spot. Okay, so here's a final shot of the block with the crank installed and the main caps torqued before I install the pistons. And one thing I like to do is just take a Sharpie and I like to go ahead and mark um, all the bolts in the torque sequence. That way I don't have to keep looking back and forth and I can just go through and torque one, two, you know, three, four, five, six, and so on. And again, there's 30 bolts with all these main caps. Don't forget about your side bolts, and those are obviously a different torque value than the mains. You can torque those last. Moving on, we will start installing the pistons. And with the pistons, I'm going to start with number one and number two and when I do that I like to rotate the crank down so you can get to the bolts the easiest also so when you're pushing the pistons through uh, less chance of hitting the rod against the crank uh, just so you don't have to worry about that quite as much when putting the piston down and so from what I said in the first of the video I did get new piston rings for my pistons just because it kept me up at night. It's one less thing hopefully I have to worry about. So I'm gonna go ahead and get all my rings installed on the clean pistons and then start assembling them inside the block. Um, there's really not a secret to doing this. It's kind of just the same as when you install the crank. You're gonna to wanna to put the piston in the bore, uh, line it up with the slot on the crank and you're going to wanna to torque that down with your plastic gauge in there, same as the crank, take your measurement, make sure your clearances are good, and then gonna go ahead and do a disassembly and do a final assemble with your lube and do your correct torque value. So I'm gonna start doing that now. Got the block rotated back over and I'm gonna start by cleaning out all my cylinder bores. I want to do a final clean on these to make sure these things are absolutely clean from any debris and contamination, uh, especially where I did a bump hone on them. Uh, they've just been sitting here covered in marble mystery oil for the last week or so. So I'm going to clean these up and I've used two different types of oil to lube my rings in the pistons and lubricate the cylinders. Uh, marble mystery oil or just regular ATF both work really well for doing your final assembly lube on these. As you can see, I've got the number one piston started in number one cylinder. Uh, I've got my piston ring compressor installed on here as well. Just have to tap the piston down the cylinder. We'll mention that I have the rings oriented correctly on this piston, and there is a little bit of ATF lube on the piston and also in the cylinder. And then the uh, upper rod bearing is situated in the rod. So now I'm just gonna tap this down a little bit and also at the same time guiding the rod so it doesn't touch the crankshaft. And it's pretty simple. You just have to give it a little bit of tap and get that seated. This will fall off and you can go ahead and align up your rod with the crank and flip it over. Got the piston tapped in flush with the deck. Now I'm gonna flip the block over and finish pushing it the rest of the way through and get everything lined up on the crank. Once you get to this point right here, usually you can just push on these pistons 
by hand and pushing through. If not, a light tap from your mallet. Just make sure you never hit the piston with a hard surface like on a hammer. Just make sure you use a mallet or a soft surface when you're tapping on those pistons. Number one cylinder is now at bottom dead center. It's resting on the crank journal. I'm gonna go ahead and put a little plastic gauge strip on there. I'm gonna put my cap on, torque it down to spec, and then pull it off and see what it looks like. So the rod clearance on this turned out to be right around two thousandths as well. Um, it kind of opens up a little bit on the outside closer to 15 thousandths, but we'll say it's pretty close to around 2 thousandths. So rod clearance, at least on number one, is good. It's within spec. So next step would be, again, clean this up, re-lube it, put the cap back on, torque it back down, and got seven more to go. So knowing that's good, I'm going to do the final assembly. On the rest of it, I will check the clearances on the others just to be sure, but I don't see any problems. The crankshaft mains went okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish assembling the pistons and get the rods torqued down and be right back. One thing I need to say about the rod bolts before I go on is, just so you guys are aware, there are two separate designs. There's an earlier and a later. This particular block, it's a 98, it's an early design, and there are two different torque values for these bolts, depending on what you have. Um, this particular one is 15 foot-pounds plus 60 degrees. The later design is 15 foot-pounds plus 70 degrees. The easiest way to tell which one you have from the outside is you'll have this hourglass looking figure on the bolt, and then it's hard to see, but there's one little pin right there, little a little dot right there. Uh, that's the first design. The hourglass is smaller and there's a dot on each side if it's a second design. If you have the bolt out, it's a lot easier to tell. The shaft is a little bit different, but just be aware, make sure you know which design yours is because there's two different torque values for those and it's pretty critical. So make sure about that before you put it together. Okay, so fast forward one night and got all the pistons in, bearings are all done, everything is torqued down. And it is ready to move on to the next step, which is going to be getting the cam installed, pulling that oil pump drive gear off, put a new gear on, new timing chain, new timing chain upper gear set, and get the oil pump put on the front of the motor and then get the front cover on that thing, as well as the back cover back here, and get my oil bypass plug out and put the new one in there, which I'm probably gonna have to take this off the stand to get access back here. Also gonna put the windage tray back on, the oil pickup tube back on, and get the oil pan on the bottom of the block. And that would conclude the short block. Um, before I move on though, I think I'm gonna point out for posterity, which clocking or orientation have you, I did my rings. So I'm gonna move the camera like this, this being the front of the motor, obviously because of the dot on the piston. What I did is the oil center ring right here at three o'clock, the bottom oil ring about here at 10.30, the top oil ring I put here at about seven o'clock, the second compression ring I've got here at nine o'clock, and the number one compression ring I've got here at three o'clock. So that was the orientation that I personally did on this motor. Um, yours may vary. So moving on, Gonna go ahead and get that off with a puller. It's not a big deal. It's not really pressed on. It's just usually stuck on with old oil and grime because there is a keyway right there that actually locks that thing in place. And when I get the cam installed, I'm gonna show you guys the easiest way to get that cam in there without a special tool. Some guys like to have a handle tool that grabs onto the cam. Um, honestly, I just use a screwdriver 
with a really long shaft. And also, I'm gonna give you guys the cam specs I'm putting on this cam when I get that in there too. The next step is to get this camshaft oil pump drive sprocket off and I've got the puller on here and like I said, these just come off really easy. A Little bit of pressure and it just pulls right off. Now I've got the front drive gear on and I've got the oil pump on and got the chain on as well. You wanna put your chain on before you put your oil pump on, otherwise it's not gonna happen. Uh, torque specs on these bolts are 18 foot pounds for the oil pump. I've also got the oil pump pickup tube on and the windage tray on. Torque specs for the pickup tube bolt are 106 inch pounds and torque specs for the windage tray are 18 foot pounds for the nuts to the studs. Next step is camshaft. For the camshaft, I'm going with one from Texas Speed. Again, guys, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I choose to use my parts because I feel like they are very good or decent parts, if not some of the best parts. Specs on this cam, 600 lift, both sides, 232, 234 duration with lobe separation, 112 degrees. And again, guys, um, I am not sponsored by anybody. If I'm using a product, it's because I really trust the product and I believe they are very good products. I don't ever use cheap stuff, even if I am broke. I will wait and save up the money until I can afford something that I want. And this was one of the camshafts I've been wanting to use in a motor for a while. And this cam is definitely substantially lumpier than the factory cam that I'm taking out. Um, this cam is set up for LS1 usage, has a three bolt front, and is set up for the camshaft position sensor on the rear of the motor. And I like to use a long screwdriver like this. This makes it very easy to lift the cam and then you can just slide it in the motor. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lube all this up with my assembly lube and get it nice and gooey and then stuff it in the hole. I should mention that I'm also using an LS2 style timing chain set. This is set up for a camshaft sensor on the front of the timing cover if you have one. Plus this is just a decent upgrade for any uh, 5.3 or LS1 motor is just go with the LS2 style timing chain set. It's a little bit beefier than the LS1 style. Got my camshaft installed and the pin is at three o'clock. So it lines up with the uh, camshaft sprocket when it's all put together. Piston is at top dead center on number one. You can't see it, but the pin, the dot position down here on the crankshaft is at 12 o'clock. And I'm going to install now the camshaft retaining plate. Do not forget that, pretty important. Without it, your camshaft will walk and you'll be spraying oil out of those two holes and you will have zero oil pressure. So what I got is a standard GM plate replacement with built-in gasket. Part number on that is 1258-9016. I believe this was about 30 bucks with the four bolts. This style comes with uh, recessions where the bolts go, so you cannot use your original bolts. You have to go with these replacement ones that have the beveled edge. And the GM part number on these is 11561455. Torque specs on those are 18 foot pounds. I've got the camshaft sprocket bolted on, and what I like to do is I actually like to put Loctite on these three bolts, um, just because this is one thing you do not wanna have come off. So I just use blue Loctite on these, and these get torqued to 26 foot-pounds. So front of the motor is done. Next step is gonna be to put the front timing cover on this. And before I forget to mention on this, it's really critical. When you put the front and rear covers on, I like to put them on first just because 
That way you can make sure they are completely flush with the bottom of the block. You want those to be put on with a straight edge or whatever you have to make sure that they do not sit below or above that for two reasons. One, so your harmonic balancer seals well against the front seal and the rear seal as well. And second is that way when the oil pan is bolted on, you don't have any oil leaks so everything sits nice and flush. All right, slight problem. Went to get my timing cover out of the box and this is what GM sent me for front timing cover. And I got this. It's for a Gen 4 motor. What I needed is one without the cam sensor on the front. So no big deal. What I did is I robbed the gasket off of it for my old cover, reused my old bolts, and I will worry about a front seal next week. One thing I like about these kits from GM here is because they come with a cover. Obviously this comes with a sensor, comes with all the bolts and both the crankshaft seal and the front cover seal all for about $65. So I'd like to do this for both the front and the rear covers, but for whatever reason, they sent me the wrong one. So plan B. All is not lost though, because I do not have to send that cover back. I can actually use it for the 5.3 build over there in the future, because not only does that have the cover I need, but that motor actually has variable cam timing, which I'm going to delete with the DOD delete. And also the front cover has a broken sensor in it and the wiring is screwed up so I can save it and use it for that motor. So I guess in a way, Win-win, win-lose, I don't know, however you want to say it, but I can use uh, parts from one and parts for the other. Must be my fucking OCD, but I like to use a machinist edge, a uh, perfectly true edge to get my alignment on the left and right side of the front and rear cover. Um, your results may vary however you, uh, how picky you are, but I like to make sure that both sides are absolutely true. Bolts on the front cover, all eight of them, 18 foot pounds. So yeah, I had to get the engine on uh, hoist for a minute to get to the rear cover. It's time to install the barbell in the back of the block. The factory one's okay. Um, I like to use this one from Improved Racing. This one's a little bit pricier, it's about 30 bucks, but it does have two Viton oil seals. Um, I like this over the original one because it actually seals on both ends so there is less chance of any contaminant bypass through the oil filter. Any chance you can get to make your engine filtration better, I'll take it. So I like to install these. This rounded end goes in this way and these actually have a threaded end in the back to make removal easy uh, if you have just a small metric bolt. So I'm going to get this stuffed in there and then Finish cleaning up these surfaces really good with some brake cleaner and get that cover put on. Again, 18 foot pounds on the cover bolts. Make sure she's nice and square at the bottom. Before I go ahead and install this rear cover, I wanted to point out kind of an interesting little fact for those of you guys who actually watch my videos all the way through. Um, this might be something you want to do on a future build of yours or the one you're doing. If you haven't already machined the block, if you have an early LS1 block, you might notice differences between the oiling on the back of these versus the later blocks. They say these don't oil as good, especially for high horsepower applications. And it's because the oil galleries do not have a crossover right here that's machined in the block. It is incorporated into the rear cover, but if you guys want a little bit better oiling and you want to pay a little bit extra money while it's at the machine shop, you might have them machine out this so it's the same as the later blocks just for a little better oiling. I personally am never going to push this to that kind of horsepower, so I'm not worried about it. But, you know, for those of you guys who want a little extra peace of mind, you might want to keep that in mind. Before I finish this video out, I'm going to show you guys another way you can use to align your front and rear covers and your oil pan when you're doing the assembly on these blocks because the front and rear and oil pan 
alignment is super critical. The front and rear is critical because if you don't align it right, you'll have leaks with your front and rear main seal and leaks to your oil pan down here. The rear, uh, excuse me, the oil pan alignment is super critical because if it is not flush to the back of the block here, you're gonna have alignment issues when you put your transmission on, whether it be manual or automatic. If it's forward too far, you're gonna have a gap here and it, this is actually structural, so you have strength issues where the block, the oil pan, the transmission is supposed to basically combine to make one solid surface. Um, if your oil pan is back too far, obviously you're gonna have severe alignment with your transmission to the block surface. So how I do these, couple ways, um, you can use the alignment tool for the front and rear seal because you always wanna do your front and rear covers first. On your rear seal, if you buy the cover like I do back here, it actually comes with a new seal on it and that helps align it very well. I've never needed to use the alignment tool. The seal from GM has a uh, piece of plastic on it like this that holds the seal to the exact same size as the crankshaft. So when you bolt it on, it's not hard, but it is a little bit difficult to actually move the cover around too much. It almost self-aligns by itself with minimal effort. Um, the front is a different story because you need either the tool or the front crankshaft pressed on to get an, an alignment with the seal. So I'll show you guys how I do that. First of all though, the best way is to put your oil pan on without the gasket and tighten up about four bolts on it. That will give you a flat surface for these to sit on and aid with your alignment. And then what I do is simple, quick way with stuff you'll probably have around the shop is take your old drive pulley from your timing set that you probably threw away, make about 10 wraps with some electrical tape that you probably have in your shop and this will make a rudimentary alignment tool. So just to show you guys, if this is not centered, that's a lot of movement you can have in there and it will cause your seal to not ride true, causing oil leaks. So one way or another, I recommend making something, doing something for an alignment tool on the front and the rear. And again, this is set on the oil pan, so it's gonna align true. And then lastly, when you get the front and rear bolted in place and tightened up great, now it's time for the oil pan. And with the oil pan, honestly, the best way I've found to do it, I've tried using large straight edges before, never works out good for me. So I usually wait on the oil pan and take it off the stand and use your bell housing. Bolt the bell housing up to the block and then use that as your back surface to push the oil pan to align it and then tighten it up in place against the block. So, I mean, there are alignment tools out there on the market, I don't have them. The best way I have found is just use your bell housing to align the oil pan. All right, everybody, so that concludes my LS1 short block assembly video. Sorry it was a long, drawn-out video, but that's about as short as I could keep it um, while going through all the steps on how to properly, or I should say somewhat, mind you, somewhat properly, assemble an LS1 short block. And remember, this will apply to pretty much any LS short block. There's going to be some variations in there, depending on to Gen 3, Gen 4, um, you know, if it has DOD lifters, if it has variable cam timing. But the basics are, are all here um, for you guys to assemble a short block. So, sorry again, long video, boring. But for those of you guys that stuck with me and watched the video, I really, really hope you learned something. I mean, that's why I'm doing this, to help pass my knowledge on out there because, you know, I'm not gonna be around forever. So, thanks again, everybody. Um, for those of you guys watching, if you like the videos, I would appreciate, you know, a thumbs up and a subscription. And the next video in this series will be finishing putting this motor back together going to be redoing the heads on it. Got to change the valve springs to a dual valve spring because this cam is not going to be happy with the factory valve springs. 
So there's gonna be some upgrades on heads as well. You get the motor put back together and then uh, hopefully get it back in the car pretty soon. This has been kind of a drawn out series, mainly because of the financial constraints. I don't have the money to be able to buy all these parts at one go. So I have to split them up along uh, four or five paychecks minimum to be able to uh, afford to, to do this type of stuff. So thanks for watching everybody. See you next time. Oh, hey, for those of you guys that are still here and uh, we're kind of curious about where I'm at so far with this as far as expense goes um, and the parts that I used in the block here. Um, what you've seen me do here is roughly about $1,200. And so that includes all new bearings, uh, crankshaft and main bearings, and the cam bearings. The front and rear covers are GM, oil pan gaskets, GM, front and rear cover gaskets obviously are GM. The camshaft was Texas Speed, it was the Torker V2 camshaft. And then we also have a new oil pump and that's a GM oil pump, a standard LS GM oil pump. It's not high volume, not high pressure, just the standard one. I found those work fine for what I build. If you're going to do, you know, a thousand horsepower application, then you might want to do something else. I don't like the high volume pumps because they'll suck your pan dry unless you have an oversized pan. And the high pressure pumps, again, I never found I needed it when these things put out 40 PSI at idle and 80 PSI wide open throttle. Yeah, that's, that's good enough for me. And then also has the uh, LS2 timing chain set on it. So... Uh, again, roughly about $1,200 in parts. Um, I might be missing something in there somewhere, but that's it. And I'm going to give you a total breakdown of everything once it's all finished, which I, I don't even want to think about that right now because it's way more than I wanted to spend on, on this car. So, <laughs> it is what it is. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you guys next time.